Good morning, everyone. Welcome. My name is Angie. I'm part of our executive team, and I just want to welcome you here this morning. I'm so glad to see all of your faces. For those of you joining us online, I'm grateful that you're here, no matter where you are in the world, that we get to celebrate this morning together. If you're new with us, we would love to know you. We would love to just hear a little bit about you um, and help you to feel a sense of belonging here. And we make that really comfortable. You can do that through a text line. You can text the word, the word new to the number on the screen, 720-513-1900. Now, we love to start our Sunday mornings here at Crossroads in celebration of who God is. And we often do that through music. So if you would, please stand, join with me as we praise the Lord. You guys may be seated. Man, that's a good way to get the blood flowing, right? 
Hey, welcome to Crossroads. My name is James. I'm uh, the pastor of engagement, which is pretty much everything spiritual growth uh, here at Crossroads. So it's great to be with you today. This is our fourth week in a series called The Friendship Dilemma, where we're looking at um, how to cultivate quality relationships in our modern culture, which is a bit of a crisis if you didn't know. Um, what I'm going to actually take us to explore today is actually not cultivating friendships per se, but the relationships you need to lose. Uh, who and how and why to unfriend. And uh, so in order to get us there, I figured I'd start with my story um, and, and uh, yeah, get after it that way. So I'm the middle child of five kids. And uh, when I was growing up, um, a pretty common practice was in the summertime, my mom would lock us out of the house between 9 a.m. and 3 o'clock. I mean, there's five of us and we'd probably trash the house, right? Pretty common practice back in the day, right? Okay, apparently I was abused as a child, but the, the good part about that was, um, was every day at about noon, my, uh, my mom would uh, bring us all in and we'd eat lunch together and watch a TV show together. And it was usually a grilled cheese sandwich and ramen noodles. And um, one of our favorite shows was the rerun of a show called Leave It to Beaver, right? I know, bring back the beeve, right? So good. So the, the premise of it is uh, there's this young, kind of a cute but naive boy named, named Theodore. His nickname is Beaver. And it's all about his life emerging as a, a kid. His older brother, Wally, um, had his buddies that he hung out with. And one of his buddies was a guy named Eddie. Eddie was a snake, right? Like, like, like about every third or fourth episode, Eddie would be on the scene and he would always caused something to happen that would either get Wally in trouble or Beaver in trouble. And it had this, this point of tension um, every now and then. Well, my older brother, who's four years older than me, uh, had his buddies that he hung out with, and one of them was a guy named Eddie. Now, um, I thought Eddie was super cool, right? Um, Eddie, um, I had this old beat up car. It had this beautiful but really horrible aroma that came from his car. As a little kid, I just thought he was totally awesome. And he always had amazing music pumping from his pioneer speakers in our driveway. And I spent a lot of my youth in the driveway with my brother and his buddies. And uh, they introduced me to the greats, right? The Eagles and ACDC and the great Tom Petty, right? And I love these guys. And I found out over the years that Eddie got my brother in a lot of trouble. Like there were stories that I knew about growing up, but then there were stories that I later found out once the Statue of Limitations uh, <laughs> kind of wore off, right? Um, but one memory I have with Eddie was when I turned 13 years old. And uh, Eddie at the time was 17 years old and he took me surfing in our home waters in Santa Cruz, California. And so, uh, we uh, went, surfed the morning, had a great time, and then we, we kind of capped our time off by having lunch together, which I was super excited about. So we pull into the Mexican restaurant. Eddie reaches in the back seat. He grabs out two, two Coca-Colas, and he opens them both, dumps half of them in the parking lot, reaches under his seat, grabs a bottle of Bacardi rum, <laughs> fills them both back up with Bacardi, and hands me, a 13-year-old, um, my first hard alcohol, um, okay? So um, I'd love to say that that was the only bad influence in my life, but let's be honest, right? Over the years, I have had those people, those guys, those girls, those buddies who have taken me places and I've done things that I probably shouldn't have done that I regret years later. But my question for you as we begin is who was your Eddie? Or who is your Eddie? Who is in your life maybe today, in person, maybe online, maybe a seasonal connection, but that person that stirs something in you that's unhealthy. And it, it may not be just bad activities. Uh, it could be a negative way of thinking or a pattern in your life, but that eddy in your life sets the trajectory in some ways for the man or the woman that you are becoming. And that's really where we're going to dive in today. We're going to explore that together. And the question that I want to answer is this. Why, when, and who should we consider unfriending? 
Why, when, and who should we consider unfriending? What do we do about those people in our life that we realize are actually causing more harm to us than good? And it may not be a legal activity, right? It could just be the way they shape our attitudes or our beliefs or our actions. And it just doesn't align with the man or woman that we ultimately want to be. Or I would say that God created you to be that God wants you to flourish and these relationships are actually bringing you down, bringing you in the wrong direction. Well, the Bible actually speaks with great clarity on this subject. Matter of fact, there's a whole book of the Bible called Proverbs, which if you read it, it, it's kind of like ancient Twitter. I mean, it's a bunch of these short little statements on wisdom, on just, just insights that will help you grow in wisdom. The entire book is built around this idea of these two poles of reality. There's wisdom and then there's folly or foolishness. And it has all these amazing sayings to kind of keep us between the lines and uh, experience all that God created us for. So here's some of the insights from Proverbs, starting in verse 13. It says this, "'Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise.'" but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. Make no friendship with a man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. A man of violence entices his neighbor and leads him in a way that is not good. The one who keeps the law is a son with understanding, but a companion of gluttons shames his father. And the New Testament tells us, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Pretty simple advice, right? So the why of unfriending certain people is this, that we unfriend because the wrong people will influence or flat out corrupt our own way of life. The wrong people will influence or, or corrupt the person that we desire to be. Now, we might but blindly believe that we're smarter than a bad influence. I did for a, a lot of my life. But if your experience is like, like mine, the reality is prolonged exposure to certain influences, just it, it, their norm becomes your norm, right? You become like them if you spend time with them. And we can fool ourselves into thinking that that's just not true, but it's not the right thing. So how do we discern these people? Well, uh, one, one, of the, one of the key questions we have to ask is, do, does the Bible tell us to separate ourselves from any and everyone who think and live differently than we do? And the short answer to that is no, that God actually created us to be resilient people who can cultivate relationships with people all over the spectrum and actually... Um, grow as individuals and be used by God in their life. Matter of fact, in Matthew 5, Jesus himself said that we are the salt of the earth. He says that we, you and I, are the light of the world. And Jesus himself in his life, he spent most of his time with shady people. Most of the men that he hung out with had questionable paths. Most of the women that followed him had uh, had uh, bad reputations, and most of the other people that came to Jesus were those that that larger society would have put on the naughty list. So Jesus isn't telling us to just isolate ourselves, live in, live in a commune, and separate ourselves from other people. So when should we unfriend someone? Well, the truth of the matter is, uh, the the Bible tells us that answer in 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 Second um, Corinthians chapter six, and it says this. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So what does that mean? Well, being yoked, um, so the uh, context of this is this culture was highly agricultural, right? So farmers in the day, they would, they would work the soil and move large objects, uh, primarily with large animals like oxen. And what they would do is they would line up two together and put what's called a yoke around their neck. And what that allowed the farmer to, to, to do was harness their strength together and actually direct them to till the soil or to move large objects. Now being unequally yoked was taking two animals that were mismatched in size or strength. 
So, and what, what, what that would do is they would be ineffective in their work and they could probably hurt one another, right? It's kind of like a Dodge truck and a Prius, right? It's like, it's not going to end very well, right? Um, and so the Apostle Paul uses that picture as an example of the kind of relationships that we should pursue. And he says, just be careful. Don't be unequally yoked with um, people who are not matched with you. It's interesting because this passage is often used in the context of marriage relationships where a lot of pastors encourage people to do not be unequally yoked, married to non-believers. And even though that's an application of it, the, in the context, it, it's the, 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 the verse has nothing to do with marriage relationships. It's relationships in general. And what he's saying is in order to experience the fullness of life and the purpose that God created us for, we need to cultivate relationships across the board where we are yoked to the right people and not yoked to the wrong people. So based on the wisdom we find here, we should consider unfriending someone when the combination of two people actually does harm to one or both of the individuals. So does this mean we shouldn't be friends with people that think different than us, root for out-of-state sports teams, hold opposing values, subscribe to different ideology on society, sexuality, moral ethics, the list goes on. And the short answer is no. Matter of fact, us cultivating friendships with people who think differently help us grow, and it puts us in proximity to have an impact in their life. But there are some relationships that we do need to cautiously consider unfriending. So what are those? Well, there's four categories of relationships that I like to lay out that I believe all relationships fall into one of these four. So the first are common relationships. And these are friendships where you hold values in common, where the other person encourages you becoming the man or woman that you ultimately want to be. And these are safe relationships, right? Uh, these are places where you can let the guard down, you can shoot straight, you, you can be honest about who you are, and they love you where you're at. And they're, they're the easiest of relationships, common relationships. Neutral relationships are those where th you might not hold values in common, but there's mutual respect. So maybe there's playful banter or joking, but it's healthy and respectful. Similar to common relationships, we can be fairly free, even though the other person does not fully agree with our worldview or value system. Again, these are pretty safe relationships as well. Influential relationships are relationships where one person has a unique opportunity to encourage the other person with their life experiences, their views in non-condemning ways. And these are relationships like a mentoring relationships where, where, where maybe because of life experience or age um, that, that the, the other individual actually gives you um, proximity and they're watching you. They're, they're studying how you're living because they're curious about adopting some of those things in your life. Those are beautiful relationships too. And all three of these, common, neutral, and influential, are relationships that I think we can easily be yoked and grow together with people. The relationships that we have to be careful about when we think of unyoked relationships are what I call influencing relationships. And these are relationships where you're bombarded by opposing views or values that do not line up with who you want to be. These relationships might have a degree of aggression or th the views are just forcefully imposed. Uh, the other person might have strong values or just a strong personality. But regardless, when you're, when you're close to these kind of relationships, you feel your anxiety and your guard growing up, right? You got to be careful and you almost have to prepare yourself for waiting in. The holidays are around the corner and some of us know this in our immediate families, right? There's those family members, you love them, but they're weird, right? And you kind of have to prepare yourself to, to draw near to them. So what do we do with influencing relationships that wound us or pull us in directions that we don't want to go? Those relationships where we feel violated um, in words or actions. And I believe these are exactly the kind of relationships that 2 Corinthians 6 is, is uh, tell, uh, telling us about. These are potentially unequally yoked relationships. So the key question we have to ask is, is the tension a lack of clarity 
or a lack of respect? Think about that. Is the question a lack of clarity or is it a lack of respect? So lack of clarity friendships are um, often those where there, there hasn't been a conversation about the, the varying value systems. Maybe there's an underlying tension simply because there's confusion, right? Maybe one person's never spoken up or the other person just assumes that everybody else views the world and life the way that they do. And in my experience, this is really common. And furthermore, I think a lot of people, it's a good thing, but a lot of people don't like conflict. So it's easy for us in these confusing relationships to just go with the flow, right? And to not try to make waves and, and not rock the boat. But this creates more uh, tension because there's confusion in the relationship. I'm not wired that way. I mean, I'm, I don't like conflict, but I wade into it pretty comfortably, not because I like to fight, <laughs> but because I hate um, confusion and disorder. So I'm the guy, like if you're a close friend, friend with me, uh, you know I ask a lot of questions for clarity just because ambiguity drives me nuts, right? So, but I know for a lot of people, th that's hard. It takes a lot of energy to ask for clarity and to, to, to see if that's the issue. So if that's you, and if you hear this and you're thinking, yeah, that's me, I don't like to rock the boat, so I just, I take what I get, right? If that's you, here's something you can consider. First, pray for wisdom. And what I mean by that is think about the relationship and say, God, what's going on here? Is this a, a lack of clarity or a lack of respect relationship? A, a give me insight into this. And if you think that it's a lack of clarity relationship, my strong encouragement is to have a conversation. Um, just uh, pursue the person, lay out your values and your, your desires, and see if you can actually come to common ground there, right? Um, and oftentimes, this can help you reset the foundation of an of a awkward relationship with tension just by talking about it, just by resolving the confusion. Um, I think about a neighbor tension, right? Where instead of just living with a weird thing in kind of shared space, just knock on the door and say, hey, can we just talk about the bush between our houses, right? Um, you can resolve that oftentimes by just having a conversation. Think about family members um, where there's tension over planning activities together, right? If you initiate the conversation, maybe you can actually land that plane a little bit earlier before the tension actually ha happens. Think of, uh, for uh, those with little kiddos, uh, think about family members whose lifestyles differ from yours, and you think about holidays and, and birthdays and stuff, and you're anxious about what your kids are exposed to. You can have a conversation and just talk about, hey, we're going to come over, but here's a couple things that just for the sake of our kids that we'd, we'd love for you to just keep between the lines. Um, opposing political or cultural views. You can have a conversation and say, I just see this differently than you do. I, I love you. I respect you. But can we just not go there when we get together? And you can actually soften up that opportunity there. See, many relationships can land in healthier places if people will just talk. And you can resolve the, the confusion and the tension through simple conversation. If this resonates with you, uh, there is a, a book out there called Boundaries by an author named Henry Cloud. Fantastic book um, that uh, he really lay, uh, lays out some simple, practical advice on how to do this well. And maybe what looks like an unequally yoked relationship just needs clarity in this. The second type of relationships are those that lack respect. And people who do not respect you and your values are those we, could st we should strongly consider unfriending. This is the crux of friending and unfriending, is that people who do not respect you and your values are those we should strongly consider unfriending. See, in our day of cancel culture, respect is a lost art as one group is trying to decide the right and wrong for others. And there's mass confusion in our culture because we're being told that respect equals affirming and celebrating the choices of others. And that's not actually true and it's not fair, right? I can respect you and disagree with something going on in your life. 
th- that's an option that I should have, but our culture actually is pushing us to make that out of bounds. I found this uh, definition this week of respect, and it's this. Respect is due regard for the feelings, wishes, rights, or traditions of others. That's it. Respect is due regard for the choices that others make. And hear this. It's reasonable for people to respect one another. And you deserve respect in your relationships. In every relationship that you enter into, um, you deserve to be respected for who you are, for what you value. Don't expect the world to affirm it or celebrate it, but you deserve respect at a base level for that. See, every human being deserves base level respect. As a beautiful human being, crafted in the image of God. And hear this, regardless of what they choose to do with the life that they've been given. And that is breaking down in our culture and that is feeding into the unhealth in our relationships. See, Jesus didn't, did, uh, did this consistently with people that he interacted with. He affirmed, uh, affirmed who they were as image bearers of God But he didn't affirm how they were living, but he loved them where they were, and he actually earned the opportunity to lead them to a better place of human flourishing. See, in our our friendship dilemma of our culture, you deserve respect from those around you. And this is the crux of the problem in our friendship dilemma. Uh, uh, What do you do with family members who simply do not respect you? How should you handle people who actively oppose your value system with continual digs, pokes, or pressure to live differently than you value or to live like they live? And how do you deal with people who passively aggressively, who passive aggressively withhold love and acceptance um, uh, because of the values that that you, uh, you, uh, you hold? And this could be driven by immaturity, narcissism, past wounds on their part. It doesn't really matter. People who simply don't respect others as a baseline, as a human being, are not good friends. And at this point, I'm sure some of you are kind of drifting out of the topic matter of this friendship dilemma, and you're thinking about um, friends and loved ones in your life who live a lifestyle that you don't agree with. And if I can, let me just kind of speak as a pastor to you. You don't have to agree with them or celebrate their life or life choices. But if you want to be in their life, you must respect them as a human being. See, everyone has free will, and we have the right to choose what we do with that life that we've been given. And equally, we will bear the consequences, or we will reap the rewards of how we live that. And respect is the only way that you and I can live in proximity with people we love to maybe be used by God in the future direction of their life. See, unhealthy friends are those who don't respect you, don't have your best in mind, and lure you to be the man or woman that you don't want to become. And these specifically are what Paul is talking about in 2 Corinthians 6. And the dangerous thing is we can be on both sides of that. We can be an instigator or we can be someone that is actually being harmed by Uh, someone who's an unhealthy friend. So I met Jesus and started following him when I was 19 years old. Um, I was uh, playing in a band in the Bay Area, and my bandmates were my best friends. We uh, hung out all the time, had a fake ID, and we we would go go to clubs all the time and see other bands, right? And um, over over a few month period, I I went to church and I heard about Jesus and I became a Christian. And uh, and I was really excited to have God in my life, and I was exploring this. And all I did was told them, hey, I, I'm a Christian now. Like, I'm, I'm following Jesus, and I think it's really cool. Now, I was still going to the clubs with them. I was still their friends. I wasn't judging them or telling them they had to live differently. I was just excited about what I found, right? And I thought we could maintain the friendship. Well, the relationship got really weird. So in the months that came, oftentimes we'd be at these clubs, and out of the blue— um, girls would come up and say or do really inappropriate things. 
which didn't happen in the past, right? And uh, what I realized was my buddies were paying or, or t- asking girls to go up to me in clubs and do or say these, these really inappropriate things just, just to try to kind of get under my skin. They started calling me Bible thumber. Even though I, I never brought a Bible anywhere in their proximity, I was, I was from that point on called the Bible thumper. And any time they could, they could say Jesus Christ in a cursing kind of way in any conversation, they took advantage of that opportunity. The final straw for me was um, when I turned 20 years old and they pooled their money together and bought me a one-year subscription to Playboy. And they thought it was hilarious, right? And a big thing for me as a 19-year-old guy was that I wanted to live differently to honor God. And part of that was, was, was a sexual relationships and honoring women in my life, right? And a magazine that, that objectified them was not on my radar of the kind of guy I wanted to be. So it bugged me in two ways. One was my landlord collected my mail. So once a month, he would hand me or his wife would hand me a stack of my pills and letters and stuff, and there'd be a copy of Playboy magazine. That sucked, right? That was embarrassing. Um, But the other part was, after they handed it to me, I had to make a choice. Was I going to throw it right in the trash, peek through it, bring it into my apartment, right? And it was this monthly tension. Like, I still remember as the date was coming that I knew it was probably coming in the mail, I would almost get sick to my stomach to get my mail. And my buddies just thought this was the funniest thing ever, when I told them about this. So have you been there? I mean, do you have a friend or a family member in your life who's pressuring you to be who you don't want to be and you feel that anxiety, that tension? And what do we do about friends whose lifestyle keeps us connected to activities that we don't want to embrace? or the friends or family members that resent the values that we hold, and they prove that by the digs that they're always trying to cause us to fall back in line with them, or the boyfriend, girlfriend, or just buddies that pull the relationship consistently where we actually don't want it to go. See, I think many of us can, can um, maintain complex relationships, but some relationships we have to ask the question, if we're just too weak to deal with the pressure that's coming at us, or if the other person or the other group is just too strong. And our awareness of that is key. See, in my situation, our values were not in common. They weren't neutral. I was not influential. And the four of them held a power card against me. There was no way that I was going to change their perspective. And, uh, it was, it, was, it was just a, a, a causing our relationship to degrade. They made it clear that us being friends wasn't possible. If the factors had been a little differently, I would have loved to maintain friendship with them, stay in the band, kind of explore that dream together. But because of the way that they were uh, handling the relationship, respect was lost and the relationship followed. So do you have those friends in your life? It could be a physical friend. It could be a friend online. It could be a seasonal acquaintance that that just stirs you in unhealthy ways. Um, I'd encourage you to consider um, if it's a lack of clarity relationship or if it's a lack of respect relationship. And here's the options that I think we have. We can have an honest conversation about the different values and lay out what matters to you and what your non-negotiables are. You're worthy of that, okay? Uh, For you to lay your cards on the table and say, this is the woman or man that I want to be. Can you honor that in our relationship? That is such a healthy conversation. If that's not possible, you can build boundaries to limit exposure with that person or limit their exposure into your life or maybe your family. And if that's not possible, you can respectfully sever the relationship. You can unfriend them and move on in health. See, the truth is to be respected, we actually have to respect ourselves first in order to establish a baseline. 
Uh, we need to know what we're about and let our closest friends be people who align with that vision. And that, uh, that makes sense, but it's not just a spiritual thing. It's a life thing, right? I mean, successful students often pair themselves with students that equally want to do well in class. And they feed off each other. They, they learn from each other how to master the subject and how to study to, to be as successful as they can. Workers in the workplace often advance by, by studying the system and finding who are the other employees that are excelling, who are crushing it. And they align themselves with the right people. Artists and musicians, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, athletes and musicians uh, do this all the time too. People that want to see how far they can take their craft. They often align themselves with people like-minded and they cultivate similar practice and training res regimens. See, the people we attach ourselves to will affect the outcome of our days and unequally yoked relationships will often confuse or crash our potential and God's best for our lives. Dag Hammarskjöld uh, shared, shared a quote that I've, I've loved for years. He says this, He who wants to keep his garden tidy doesn't reserve a plot for weeds. That's gold. He who wants to keep his garden tidy doesn't reserve a plot for weeds. See, quality control in our closest relationships is key to our human flourishing. And the closer they are, the more time we spend um, with people, they will have the greatest impact on us. The truth is God created all of us for relationships. We're hardwired for it. Uh, even the most introverted uh, people amongst us, you need other people in your life to pull you out to experience the, the wonder and awe of life and all that God created us for. But choosing to friend and unfriend the right people is key to our health, our, our health in that. And the people that we allow closest to us will truly have the greatest impact. And that's why here at Crossroads, um, we consistently talk about pursuing Jesus. Um, because we believe that Jesus can be known. And knowing Jesus as your first position friend, it sets the trajectory for every other relationship in your life. See, the Bible teaches us that Jesus amazingly came into our story of human brokenness and disorder, that he showed us God's love and invited us to friendship and life. And because Jesus is God, he's able to be befriend broken people like me and like you and actually transform us into health. In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus says this to us. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, Jesus harnessed himself to us to show us, to offer us a new way of living. And that's our desire for you, that you would not just know about Jesus, but know Jesus and experience him as that first position friend in your life. So in my life, um, I unfriended my bandmates, quit the band, and really lost my friends. My, my, my buddies, my circle of, of uh, guys to, to ha uh, hang with. And then three weeks later, I was mountain biking, and I broke my arm. So I was out of work for six weeks, right? So I didn't have my friends anymore. I didn't even have a job to go to because I was all banged up. So what did I do? Um, I went to Big Five and I bought the best lawn chair as I could, that, that I could afford. And for six weeks, I went to the, the park with my Bible. And I just sat under a tree with a bottle of water and read the Bible and read about Jesus and talked to him and cultivated a friendship with Jesus in a deep, meaningful way. And that set the foundation for everything in my life. Jesus as my first position friend allowed me the, the perspective to invite the right people in. And God in his goodness, he brought good people into my life. So months later, I met a couple buddies at church, a, a guy named Sean and another guy named John. So uh, Sean was a really great mountain biker. And I started riding with him a few times a week. 
and he introduced me to all of his buddies. Some Christians, most not, but they were very neutral guys. Uh, we could have fantastic conversations and uh, go out and enjoy God's creation together. John was a, a great musician, and he introduced me to all the musicians at our church. And I learned how to play music um, for a completely different person or to per, per, a purpose, to uh, honor God and celebrate his goodness through the, the, the gift that he gave me. And that all changed because I experienced Jesus as that first position friend in my life. So where are you? So what resonates with you in this message? It, if I can encourage two things. One is prayerfully consider your, your friend group. And are there those, those lack of clarity or those lack of respect friendships? And if, if it's the, the, the a latter, really consider unfriending some people or provide some clarity so you can move forward with greater health. But my other encouragement is, who's your first position friend in your life? And may I lovingly say, consider Jesus there. Again, don't learn about Jesus. Get to know Jesus. And we would love to help you do that. So I'm starting a new ministry here at Crossroads, um, taking people mountain biking. And I think in two or three sessions, I can break a bone uh, on your body if you want to just joking. Um, yeah, I, I have someone that's interested, okay. Um, but really, we would love to help you pursue Jesus. And the way that that happens here at Crossroads is you can shoot us a text. You can text the number on the screen, text the keyword Jesus. We're not going to pressure you. We're just going to meet you where you are, probably get a Bible in your hand, and encourage you to explore a relationship with Jesus as that first position friend. Because we believe that's key to our flourishing. And Pastor Matt's going to unpack that in greater detail for us next week. So let me pray for us. God, thank you for my friends. I just thank you, Jesus, that you are a God that pursues broken people. You can be in position with um, the worst of people, Jesus, and transform our lives. And I'm just so grateful for the way that you met me where I was at and many in this room and drew us to uh, a whole different way of living that is anchored on you. Lead us uh, to pursue the right things and to ultimately pursue you. And we pray this in your name. Amen. If you'll pull out your communion elements and go ahead and open it up, uh, and, and we'll take it together in just a second. So we take communion every week here at Crossroads. And the reason why is because we celebrate what Jesus did. Like, there, there's no friend in the world who has done what Jesus did for us, who he willingly, matter of fact, the Bible says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And Jesus bore our sins, our brokenness on the cross to restore us to life. And that's good news. So we, we take these elements week after week, remembering his broken flesh and his spilled blood that gave us life. So with joy, let's break this together and celebrate Jesus' sacrifice. And we raise the cup to celebrate the victory that Jesus had because our victory is in his victory. Let's drink this in celebration of Jesus. And some of you may be carrying a burden today that it's just a heavy weight. Maybe you walked in, maybe uh, something came up while I was speaking and you just want to be lifted from that. I'd encourage you as we sing of God's goodness together, at any time you can exit and you can go to the back corner and there's loving people who would be honored to pray for you and with you and get that burden off your back. God doesn't want you to carry it. But for the rest of us, we're going to stand and we're going to sing of the goodness of God and celebrate his first love for us. As we process um, what was just shared and taught to us today, I just wanted to share with you guys a quick story of an experience that I had recently. My family and I had this incredible time getting to go to Disney World, which you guys, it blows my mind. So magical. It was so fun. Um, but at one point during the trip, we were standing in line, which the lines can be very long, but they make it all a part of the experience, you know. And so we're standing in line, and the line kind of weaves through these um, 
kind of aisles of like lockers, I would say, like these metal base lockers. And while we're standing in that part of the line, the ride breaks down and they're like, okay, we might be here for an hour. Like who knows how long we're trying to maintenance the ride and where everybody's like, oh no, you know, nobody wants to get out of line. They want to have this experience, but we're all waiting. And so my dad leans over and he goes, watch this. And so then he just ba starts banging on the locker. He goes, boom, boom, cat. Yes, like that feels <laughs> so good. You guys know we will rock you, right? So it literally, like wildfire, like spreads through the line. It was crazy. Like it just, the entire line, just from my dad starting it right there, and it spread all the way up through. And it was just this really incredible experience of um, just connection and experiencing um, community, even with people that we don't know, you know, but we're all having this experience together and feeling connected through just doing a simple beat and, and singing a song. And it just reminded me of this beautiful opportunity that we have each week when we're invited to sing and to worship together, what kind of unity that brings and what an awesome and healing experience it is to just raise our voices together, to express our love to God through raising our hands and through clapping and singing and hearing your neighbor sing the same words that you sing. And, um, I just wanted to encourage you with that today, that no matter where you're at, if you're feeling lonely, if you're coming in with heartbreak today, if you're coming in with tons of joy, that we all, no matter where we are, have this opportunity to commune with each other, to feel connected to one another, and to connect with the Holy Spirit, to have an experience with our Savior through music. So as you're processing and praying for um, discernment, maybe wisdom about what was shared today, I just wanna invite you to ask the Holy Spirit to join you in that space, to join with those around you and let's sing together. Here we go. I'm coming with a heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter. Souls looking to the living God. I'm ready for a real revival. Oh, Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. Holy Spirit, fall in this place. Fill our hearts. Holy Spirit, come like a flood, like a fire. Holy Spirit, come.
that is sinking sand. Stomp your feet and Come clap on, your hands up, beat around the rock. On Christ's solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Stomp your feet and clap your hands up, beat around the rock. On Christ's solid rock, I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. Stomp your feet and clap your hands.
Well, hi guys. Uh, my name is Nick, and this is my lovely wife, Angie. And um, I just wanted to come up here and tell you a little bit about communion. Um, if you haven't, if you couldn't tell yet, we really love community here at Crossroads. And one of the ways that I'm involved in community here is through the Connections team. Um, we host the patio parties that are held out front of the church here. And our next one is actually Halloween patio party that's coming up on the 29th. And what's great about these events is that it gives us an opportunity to not only come together as community inside of the church and get to know each other a little better, but it also gives us an opportunity to reach out into our world and invite friends and family to come and join our community and get to know what we do here at Crossroads. So we've made that really simple for you this month. We put together this little bag that you can grab on your way out through the lobby um, and just hand it out to someone that you know and invite them to come and see what we do here at Crossroads and become part of this community that we love so much. Yeah, we really want to help you find your people. We want to help you find your tribe. And we know that as adults, it's hard. It's awkward sometimes to make new friends. And so we want to make that as relational um, and as just practical as possible. And so we do that every month through something called Next at Crossroads. It's a monthly gathering where we come together, we share some really good food, we talk, and we get to share a little bit about with you about how you can get connected in different communities here at Crossroads. It's actually happening today, right at 11 o'clock. And we have space available. So if you're new and you are ready to take that next step and you wanted to see what community looks like here at Crossroads. I invite you to come join me for lunch. Um, we're having soup and salad. It's going to be amazing. Also, if you've been here for a minute and you just haven't really got connected yet, this is for you as well. Nick and I have been here for, I don't know, close to 20 years and it took us years to take that step of connection. So I wish we would have done it sooner. And so we invite you into that space as well. Now, if you consider Crossroads Church your spiritual home, we would invite you to partner with us in generosity. God is doing incredible things within this community and in the community at large around this church. And we get to partner together to make some of these amazing things happen. And so we can do that through giving. And you can give if you're in the building as you leave through the black kiosk in the back of the room. You can also download our app or go to our website. You wanna search Crossroads ABC for either one of those platforms. And you can give that way. And now let me just pray this benediction over you as you leave. It comes from 2 Corinthians. It says, finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. God bless you, and have a great week. Amen. See you guys. Happy Sunday. We'll see you next week.